Aloha and welcome to our second day of our three-day online workshop series. And this is our OLP series sponsored by NFLRC. And this year we are focused entirely on the practice of teaching Mandarin Chinese in an online environment. I do want to welcome everyone back who was here on Monday or whatever day that was in your time. But we have another fantastic day of discussions, and I really look forward to getting into this one. Just a few quick housekeeping items I want to share before we get started. Much like yes, or the Monday session, this session is going to run in a very similar fashion where we will have a panelist discussing questions related to teaching Mandarin Chinese. And today's topic is more about interacting in an online environment. And then we will hopefully have some time at the end of the session to have discussions about specific questions that you might have, questions for the panelists. So we would warmly invite you, if you're comfortable, to turn on your camera and your microphone and share your questions or your comments with the panel. And that will be toward the end. We will also have another about five minute break to kind of break up the session a little bit around an hour in. But we do look forward to this session. And for those of you who are earning the badge, um, just a couple of very quick reminders here. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen because I do want to point out the uh, website that we have here that will help you if you are looking to earn the badge and, and earn potentially CEU credit as long as your organization would allow that. I definitely would encourage you to check in with your organization if you are looking to earn the CEU credit if you are not part of the NCVPS group. So here on our website, we've got a lot of resources for you. We have information about our series, our panelists for you. And then down toward the bottom, we also added this new list of the resources that were mentioned during our first panel. Now, keep in mind, we personally have not gone through and vetted all the resources, but these do come recommended by our panelists who are very experienced and well-seasoned in the online teaching world. So these might be things that you might want to check out and, and see if that might be a good fit for your classroom. And then here's our digital badge criteria here. Um, this is not mutually exclusive. You can potentially just earn the digital badge issued by NFLRC, or you can just get the CEU if you prefer to do that, or you could also do both. But basically this outlines exactly what you'll need to do. So their criteria are attending all three of the Zoom panel sessions live and being a participant in our asynchronous activities. We have our Padlet discussions that are listed and we'll also have a three, two, one reflection, an exit survey, and some hands-on activities to do. And all of those will be submitted whenever they're completed by the end of our session. And we do have a deadline of July 15th, 2023 to complete all of the tasks, but that should be more than sufficient time. I also wanted to point out that if you need help with anything, if you have questions, please do not hesitate to reach out to me. Uh, my email was sent out in the email that was sent on Monday. So please don't hesitate to reach out if you have questions, if you need help with anything. But for now, I would kind of just invite you to sit back and relax. And if you do have questions or concerns that come up, please don't hesitate to put those in the chat. We will be monitoring the chat during the uh, conversation. But I really look forward to getting into our discussion today. I think this is going to be a very good one. Just to briefly introduce or reintroduce some of our panelists as well. Again, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. I want to introduce and or reintroduce our panelists for those of you who maybe were not here before. And I thought this time we would go in reverse alphabetical order. Um, everybody here has had an amazing resume and I'm very excited to introduce our panelists once again. So starting today with Terry Waltz and Terry is a Mandarin Chinese educator certified in New York State. She's also the author of TPRS with Chinese Characteristics. She's got many unique contributions to the field, including cold character literacy for non-Roman alphabet L2 reading, the top system of tonal spelling, directional gestures for reinforcement of tone knowledge and performance. She also holds a MA degree in conference interpreting from Fujian Catholic University, and she is also a doctorate in applied linguistics and foreign language acquisition, and she has that degree from the University of Texas at Austin. Also joining us today, we have Ying Jin, and she is an instructor of Mandarin Chinese at Cupertino High School. She teaches level one all the way up through advanced placement. She brings to us today 20 plus years of teaching Mandarin Chinese, and she has been awarded many different quite remarkable accomplishments. In 2016, she was awarded the CTLA Teacher of the Year 
in 2017, she was awarded the SWCOLT Teacher of the Year Award, and then in 2018, she was awarded with ActPol's Honor of Teacher of the Year. She holds an MA in Instructional Technologies from San Francisco State University and a BA in Chinese Language and Literature from Peking University in China. And also joining us today is Matt Koss. Matt is a PhD student in Second Language Studies at Michigan State University. He brings 12 plus years of teaching both Spanish and Mandarin Chinese in person and online levels ranging all the way from novice to superior, elementary to university level and ages spanning from three to 80. And his research focuses on connection between research and practice, focus on task-based language teaching and assessment, also language program decision, design rather than evaluation and educational psychology. He holds a BA in Hispanic linguistics and Chinese, and he also has a master's in second language acquisition from the University of Maryland. As panelists, I want to warmly welcome you. We are very happy to have you with us and really looking forward to a great discussion. And this isn't a super formal discussion. Um, ultimately, what we want to have is to have a lively discussion, again, share with you our, our thoughts and feelings, and ultimately, hopefully, give our folks here who are joining us today some new things to think about as they are teaching Mandarin Chinese online. So I want to start off with the very first question, and that is thinking kind of from your very beginning aspects of teaching. How do you start teaching a language like Mandarin Chinese in general? Do you start with things like pinyin, sound systems, and characters? And kind of segueing into that, what do you think works the best or better for learning Mandarin Chinese online in your experience? And today I'm going to go ahead and start with Walt Laoshi. If you can please share your thoughts about those topics, I will be more than happy to repeat any part of the question as well if needed. I thought it was safe after I married Mr. Waltz and became a W last name there. I don't know. Um, it's very difficult for me to explain how I begin beginners, but I have about a three minute video clip that would show you. Would that be okay if I share that? We'd love to. Uh, if I can make it come up here, I should be able to. So start, whoops, not like that. I start that in the right program, yes. Okay, then I share my screen. I have to narrate what I'm doing, it's terrible. I cannot share my screen without saying I'm sharing my screen. I don't know why. Okay, can everybody see a, a very black thing with a, okay, good. We so can. Go. The subtitles are totally pretentious, I apologize. The Ooh. This is a real class. Ma. What does that mean? Superman. Cool. Is Superman cool? Is Superman cool? Yay! Good for you. Superman cool, ma. Superman cool, ma. Cool. 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 Mm -hmm. Superman cool. And when I say cool, I'm going to use a gesture cool like this. The thumbs up, and I'm going to move it downward. Okay, cool. Because my voice has to go downward too. Superman cool. Hmm. Superman cool. Ooh, cool. Superman cool. Superman cool. Superman cool. So what did that question? Superman cool. Ooh, cool. Is Superman cool or not? Is cool? Superman cool or not cool? Yeah. So there's two uh, ways to ask a question. It's Superman cool. Mm -hmm. hmm. Gonzalo cool. Ma? <laughs> Caroline, you sure? Gonzalo, cool, cool, cool. Yeah. Ah, Gonzalo, cool. Oh, Gonzalo, cool. Ah, wow. Caroline, sure. What does sure mean? Says. Yes, says, right. Oh, there it is. Der. Caroline, sure. Gonzalo, cool. Ni, cool. Oh, cool. Okay. So asking you. Buku. Cool. Am I cool or not cool? Right. Ni ku bu ku. Wu ku. Ah, Gonzalo shu. Ta ku. You don't have to listen to the whole hour. Don't worry. Caroline ni shu. Gonzalo ai bu ai Justin Bieber. 
who I, Justin Bieber, Yin Wei Haley I, Justin Bieber. Haley I, Haley. Um, his wife, I think. Oh, he's married. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's what I know. <laughs> oh, Haley I, Justin Bieber. Haley I, Bu I, Gonzalo. Haley, yeah, I. <laughs> yeah, I will. You would say I will. Right? Okay. Oh, Haley, I, Justin Bieber. Dan Shu. Haley, yeah, I, Gonzalo. Oh. Hmm. Hmm. Haley, I, Gonzalo. Hmm. Haley, I, Bu, I, Gonzalo, the chin. Haley I Gonzalo. Ah, Haley I Gonzalo. Tabu I Gonzalo de Chien. Ta I Gonzalo. Inwe Gonzalo. Inwe Gonzalo, yep. Who? Mm. Haley I Ta. Haley I Justin Bieber. Dan Shu. Ta I, Justin Bieber, the chin. Haley Shu, Justin Bieber, Bu Hao. Justin Bieber, Bu Ku. Dan Shu, Wu I, Ta the chin. All right. Just to give you an idea, whoa, not again. I think once was more than enough. Um, it's just to give you an idea of the kind of input, the kind of back and forth that we have. That was the first hour of a new class. I'd never had Mandarin before. So we would repeat this again and add, you know, a word or two at a time over the next two or three hours. And when they were really solid on all the words, then they would read directly in characters. So no opinion on the characters. My goal is to get a little tiny MP3 recording, I guess that's the latest technology, in Chinese, in their heads, so that when they read, their eyes say, I don't know this, but their ear says, I know what comes next. And then they kind of interact. So that's how I do it. Most impressive. And I am amazed that that is a group that's never been exposed to Mandarin Chinese before. That was fantastic. And having that interaction, making it fun, and also a little bit of elements of spontaneity in there, some unexpected answers, it definitely makes it a lot of fun. Wow, that was amazing. And I love that we were actually able to see starting from the very beginning and kind of the progression that the students are taking through the very first lesson. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. That was amazing. Thank you. But it was okay. I wasn't sure, but good. Fantastic. Thank you. Excellent. And I'll, again, the same question, I'm going to pass the question to Kas Laoshi. How do you start what? teaching online in general? What do you start with? And then kind of segueing into what works better in your opinion for online learning of Mandarin Chinese in your experience? Sure. Um... A couple things. So the first thing with online anything, or I would actually say teaching in general, right, is I think as important as getting to the thing you're there to be doing is making sure that you are establishing sort of sense of community and safe space and what you're there to do and why the people in the room are there and what it sort of means to learn something, particularly something that can be as exciting but also as anxiety inducing as another language right to sort of put yourself back in that space where you suddenly are stripped of your ability to sort of be funny and be interesting and be fully yourself is actually a really challenging thing to do right so I think from the beginning making sure that you kind of have that community and that's going to look perhaps technically a little bit different online versus in a physical space but conceptually I think is really similar no matter the kind of space you're in so for me it starts um, day one, this typically happens after some Chinese stuff, and I'll talk about that in a second, but day one, sort of just having a conversation around what it means to be a good student, what it means to be a good classmate, what it means to be a good teacher, and perhaps what it means to be not as good of a student, classmate, and teacher, and I, you would be surprised how kids as young as four or five can tell you a lot about what they need and want and prefer and have experienced already when you sort of scaffold it that way. Um, it typically looks like a lot of sticky notes on walls and conversations in my first day or two. Um, so one thing is, is establishing that space that we're a community, we're here to see each other be successful and win. This is going to be a long process. 
but also a very enjoyable process and also a process, a process that you're going to benefit a lot from and one that doesn't have to be miserable or overly stressful. I think something really nice that came out of the video we just watched of Terry's is that you're getting these really nice wins really quickly, right? You're sort of either overtly or implicitly dispelling kind of some of the myth around Chinese is hard and Chinese is impossible. And this is going to be really unenjoyable for you. Um, I think people out there in the world have all kinds of ideas about what it means to learn Chinese and learn another language in general. And that's informed by like their own experience, what they've heard from other people, but it's informed even by simple things that we language professionals are guilty of this too. go around and say things like, you know, Chinese is a category four language. And we are often our own worst enemy telling people things like Chinese is really difficult. So one of the things I tell my students really early on is Chinese is different. It's distant from English in a couple of really important ways, This, in a similar way that someone who's coming from a background with literacy in Japanese would not find Chinese characters, for example, to be all that overwhelming or, you know, new. Um, so, but the key is let other people think Chinese is difficult, but between you and me, it's actually not nearly as difficult as the world makes it out to be. Other people thinking it's difficult is to your benefit, right? Because then they think you're smart and you work hard and you're interesting and whatever. But secretly in our classroom, I think it's really important to dispel very quickly that language learning is a miserable experience, that language learning is overly challenging, that language learning cannot be full of interesting interaction and fun. And the other one that I really try to get in students' heads as quickly as possible is that it's not a competition. Um, I think one of the things that school does to students from a really young age is make them aware of sort of where they stand in relation to other people, whether they're an A student or not, things like that. And what I tell my students is it's not scientific to compare yourself to anybody but yourself. So you compare where you are at the end of that hour with Terry to where you started at the beginning, right? Which is zero to anything. And that's a win. Even if someone else in the room you perceive got zero to further than you, right? Because them being good or not good or better or worse doesn't actually change anything for you. So I think for me that the, the keys to language teaching in that early stage is you sort of want to win their hearts and minds a little bit and make sure also that you get whether it looks like some input and wow, look how much you can understand, even though you came in here not knowing any Chinese at all, or some sort of a task that by the end of this first class period, you're going to be able to do something as simple as introduce yourself to people you don't already know in a language you didn't know any of before you got here, or you're going to be able to do a little bit of reading in this first hour or learn something about the writing system that you didn't know before, whatever it is, it's that we're a safe space and community and let's get a quick win or two. So by the end of this day, you're looking forward to coming back and not thinking, wow, this first day of Chinese was miserable. I'm out of here. I think that's, I think that's where I'm living these days. That's definitely understandable. We won't tell anyone that Chinese is not a hard language to learn. We'll kind of keep that between the group here. Um, I like that you mentioned getting those quick wins and then also distancing yourself from the idea that this is going to be very hard, this won't be fun, and, and getting those quick wins there. It's going to essentially kind of keep the students coming back. So I, I love that philosophy, and that's kind of one that I take with me as well as an online educator. So thank you for sharing your thoughts on that. We'll pass that question to Jin Laoshi, and again, the question is, how do you start teaching Mandarin Chinese online in general? And what do you find works better for online learning in your experience? Uh, I think I just totally agree with what uh, Terry Laoshi and Gao Laoshi just shared earlier. I think uh, for me, again, I teach high school. Uh, kids might be a little different from you know college level or younger kids, right? And um, so I remember, um, you know, uh, for the Zoom year, I call that the Zoom year. Um, I decided to change my curriculum a little bit. Uh, I used to have unit, you know, for Chinese one, I have unit one, two, three, four, you know, like greetings, family, you know, a daily routine, that kind of thing. But I decided to add unit zero before unit one. 
and uh, the idea is I understood very well online learning experience would be very different from physical classroom learning experience so I think it takes a little longer and the uh, the interaction between teacher and students is different so in that unit one I just still remember the day one first time teaching ninth graders with no Chinese background online um, and I think if you remember I shared last time uh, besides the textbook I also asked uh, my school to give each kid a, a little whiteboard to bring home right so I think my goal for day one was very clear I want my students to feel like um, they uh, they had a big achievement online day one you know learning Chinese online so I just told myself if at the end of the class they were able to say ni hao and they were able to write number one to ten I'm extremely I would be extremely happy so that's exactly what we did we started the class with a kahoot with a lot of culture questions Chinese culture questions you know and uh, some language questions there such as um, is Cantonese at it also a national standard language for you know for China that kind of questions and then uh, I just started to teach Ni Hao and you know just practice with the students I only show them the characters so we started just by looking at the characters I think actually to the students it would be fascinating because it's very different from you know um, what the language they are familiar with right so this is a Ni Hao. A lot of them have heard Ni Hao many times living in the Bay Area. You know, they have, you know, uh, they had exposure to Chinese language more or less. But these two characters actually are the characters for Ni Hao. I think they were like, wow, okay. The, now we know it's a new language, uh, you know, and this is how you pronounce it. So I didn't go into team right away. I just say, this is me, this is how, say it after me, me how. I, I wanted to say pin for the next uh, step. And, and then we started to learn uh, number one to 10 using the little whiteboard. And I told my students, um, in, when you write Chinese characters, uh, you follow certain orders. So I just start to do one and using my finger to show this is one and, and two, this is two, this is three, right? And I told my students before I wrote those characters, just observe, you know, very carefully, see if you can see um, the, uh, the general rule or one of the general rules for writing characters. They are high school kids, right? They can figure it out very quickly. Hop down, yes. And then we move to number four and I told them not adding one more line is now number four. It's a totally different character, number four. And then I did it again and asked them to observe. And one of them said, oh, it's like outside, inside, then close the box. That's what, you know, just, I think by doing, by asking my students actively participating you know in the activity in the classroom you know learning process they actually can do a lot but I, I definitely I want to say my personal experience is that uh, online learning does take a little longer than you know in the physical classroom but at the end all my students were able to say ni hao uh, although I need to fix the tones a little bit, but pretty good. And uh, they were able to, to recognize number one to 10. You know, writing, be able, being able to write number one to 10, you know, actually took a little longer. But I think being able to recognize is a great achievement already. And I think they were really happy. They feel like this is a language they are able to work on, they are able to acquire. It's not like, oh my God, something so boring. I hate that word, but something is too uh, exotic. They're not able to do. No, they're, they're able to do it. I think 
day one to build that confidence since day one is just so critical. Excellent. And I can certainly vouch in terms of having that feeling of pride and accomplishment that I've done something. And I like the idea of you starting with what they know. They know ni hao, but do you understand the characters and let's have a discussion around it. And now they can build a connection. Okay. Mandarin Chinese is something I can connect with. You're building that connection. I also have to vouch. I remember my very first week of studying Japanese at university level. I called my grandmother at the end of the week and I told her, grandma, I learned all 46 hiragana characters in a week. So I'm sure your students came home and had these dinner table conversations. Mom, dad, I can write one through 10 in Mandarin Chinese and I can do it all by myself. And I know what it means. So you know, those are the kinds of things that as educators, we kind of need to take those wins in our back pocket. It's the students are making those connections and they're telling other people about their accomplishments and they're proud of themselves. So excellent. I love that answer. Thank you. And we're going to go ahead and move to our next question now. And that deals more with engaging students in the interactive portion. So thinking about online activities, the ones that you as educators find, what are the most effective in terms of engaging the students? in those online interactions in Mandarin Chinese. So thinking about the exercises that you do with your students, what do you find that's most engaging in getting them to interact with you in that online environment? Pas Lao Shi, I'll start with you, please. Sure. Um, I think there's a saying in Chinese, right? Uh, you spend 10 years off the stage for just one minute on the stage, right? So I think as I think about sort of how do you design a learning experience to be successful, particularly one online, which has its own sort of unique challenges. And perhaps interaction is one of those that we think of the most often because we don't perceive it as like you can turn and talk to your neighbor, that there's sort of technical steps involved in getting you to be able to interact in those sort of peer conversations that keep everybody engaged. I think one of the things we get trained on as teachers really early is the more you can sort of have people turn and talk, even if it's really briefly to appear, rather than you and one person and 28 other people sitting there doing nothing, because why would they listen? They, they wouldn't and they wouldn't, you wouldn't either. In the staff meetings, we check out too. Um, I think really importantly, it comes down to sort of how are you planning for them to have those interactions? And what it came, what it came down to for me, really, as I started to design things, was giving them a reason to interact, right? Whatever the activity is, whatever the specific goal is, you know, whatever the sort of format is that you decide works best in terms of interaction, whether that's text chat on something like a Google Doc, whether it's going to breakout rooms, briefly having an interaction and coming back, whether it's using Google Chrome extensions, one that I learned about in the pandemic in, in some space, probably not dissimilar to this online workshop that we're doing was Moat, which is a Google Chrome extension that you can talk on Google Docs. Um, whatever the, the sort of format is, um, I think what's most important is you give them a reason to, to actually be interacting. And that reason comes kind of in a couple of levels for me. Best case scenario, the reason is we're talking about something that I actually want to talk about. So I ask you to go find out whether Jin Lao is going back to China this summer, and I actually care to know the answer to that question. Great. You're going to put us in a breakout room, and we're going to actually talk about that. Um, often, though, because we are given content that we have to teach, or not all students are engaged on the same level, you know, we... We do things like we teach daily routines and you know what 14 year olds never talk about when they brush their teeth in the morning. But sometimes we say, you know, go ask your partner what time they brush their teeth in the morning. Nobody cares. The person doesn't actually care about the answer to that question. So if you can get a topic you actually care about, awesome. But if not, I think one of the other things we can do to give people a reason to listen is give them accountability after the interaction. You can't possibly go to... 10, 15 breakout rooms, especially if the interaction is going to be short, right? If you're sending them to a breakout room for 60 seconds, they're going to exchange a little bit of information and they're going to come back. You can't possibly make it to, you're maybe going to listen to one room between, you know, sort of the speed of Zoom kind of moving you there and moving you back. So what I, I gave that up, I honestly, I told my students I was always coming to the breakout rooms and I assumed that they would always assume that I would be in a different one and who knows when I was going to pop up. But I didn't. I stopped going because what I started doing instead was giving them something at the end of the interaction that they were going to have to prove that they did it. 
And what that can be as simple as you asking someone, what did your partner just tell you? What did you just find out? Right. Often it looked like having them because our students were one to one with devices. It had them recording something and it would be something along the lines of, you know, my partner said he does this, this and this on the weekend. I told him I do this, this and this on the weekend. So we have these two things out of three in common. It would be something that is a follow up task that sort of ensures that accountability. So I think to come back to that sentence that Jin also so kindly put into the chat, right, this idea of that the devil is in the details, the prep happens for the teacher in the thinking beforehand, rather than sort of what specific activity is it that works best, because I think we're all under different technological constraints. You know, Terry has that really nice platform that I think she made herself, right? Not all of us have access to synchronous teaching, much less sort of all of the fancy technology that we can use if we're on an iPad versus a Chromebook versus a laptop. Um, so I think for me, it's really that accountability piece uh, that holds people a little bit responsible for doing whatever the interaction is in the classroom. The accountability piece is definitely key. I personally primarily work with the high school population. So sometimes you do need that sense of accountability. But I also like how when we can, we can't always do this, but I do like like you, I like to work in topics the students actually care about and they're interested in. It gives them some motivation to say, okay, I'm going to go find out this information and, and find something that I might be interested in. So thank you for that. Excellent. And I'll pass the same question to Jin Laoshi. And again, the question was, what activities have you found are most effective and engaging in teaching students in this online environment, trying to get them to speak and, and work with their Mandarin Chinese? Um. I really like what Gao Lao Shi just mentioned. I think um, for 21st century teachers, uh, we really have to, to be creative, to be open-minded, to find topics that um, matter to the students. So I, I'm not going to repeat, I think Gao Lao Shi said it really, really well. And uh, I think there were, other two folds after we identify interesting topics. Uh, number one is we need a, to find a platform or platforms to capture students' interaction, right? And also we need to find um, a way to, how do I say that? It's not, well, maybe it's also a platform. What, what I was thinking was, um, my school district is using a, a, a LMS called Schoology. And Schoology has a function called discussion board. And when we started to use it, I think at that time, either the school district didn't buy the function or Schoology didn't design that function. It could only capture uh, typing. But I think now you can do both speaking and Typing. I think that's great. That's a great, great platform for students to interact. So after I post um, a qu discussion question to the class, uh, I usually just ask each student to share their thoughts. And definitely, uh, usually I give them, a, you know, a deep modeling a little bit to show them, you know, this is what I would like you to, to, to say or to think. And also, after each person uh, shares his or her thoughts, I ask them to give feedback, to have another round, you know, just adding another round of interaction. Uh, so they need to give comments to, to classmates' posts. And, well, sorry, three. So usually I, I want everyone, every student has someone to comment on, you know, their posts, right? So I usually just tell this, my students give comment to the student who put the post on top of you and below you and the third one is free of choice you can go to anywhere you know find your friend or you know find the post that really interests you to you know make a comment and students are also encouraged to respond to the comment so it can be really a you know back and forth back and forth um you know um activity um, another thing I want to share is uh, during the pandemic here, I happened to learn an activity called uh, Five Whys. It's actually an activity originally um, 
developed by Toyota, the, uh, the, the car company. And they, I think they figured it out. If you really want to find the root cause of a problem, you need to ask why five times. So it's like, why you are late to school? Oh, because I got up late. Why you got up late? Because I didn't go to sleep early. Why you, did, you know, like that. And I just thought it, it would be a perfect interpersonal activity. It's, I, I don't know if I should call that a platform. It's not really a platform, but you know, it's, um, it's just a, a way for students to, you know, interact. So I think the beauty is we are not just teaching students to learn a language. I think at the same time, we're actually teaching them some life skills. So maybe this problem solving skill, I'm hoping, you know, in the future, will help them, you know, in their career, you know, when they, I don't know, go to college. So I remember one uh, discussion I had with my level four was uh, why <laughs> some students turned in work late. So I want them to find out the root cause. It was amazing. They, you know, I got all different kinds of answers, you know, because we got too many homework assignments because, you know, uh, the internet at home was not reliable or all, all those different answers. So actually the five why um, strategy developed by Toyota, just stop here. You identify the root cause, that was it. But for me, I wanted my students to go one step further and I just pair them up after they identify the, the root cause. And sorry, I, I'm moving a little too fast. Let's go back. I put them actually not in breakout room because I just paired them up randomly. It's like, really, you might even don't know who your partner was when they did this activity. I really wanted to create this, you know, true interpersonal, spontaneous, unrehearsed, you know, scenario. So two partners, you know, uh, worked on a Google slide. They just type why and keep asking why until they identify the root cause. After that, I put them in one breakout room. I want them to talk and figure out the solution for that root cause. It cannot be just say, this is the problem. I want them to think about how can we solve the problem? And then they just also on this slide now, they can talk you know, uh, face to face on Zoom figure out the solution and type it out on the Google slide. So I think I really heard good feedback from my students. Um, so the, uh, the, uh, the prompt I give my level four is why they turn the homework late. And the prompt I gave my AP student that year was why even today we still see uh, uh, Asian hatred in the society. Oh my God. And they, I remember some um, root cause they identified uh, include um, some communities um, don't have too many interactions with people with different cultural backgrounds. So their solution was we need to invite, um, you know, diverse cultural, you know, uh, components or, you know, uh, people or presentations to those communities. It was really, I, I was really touched by, you know, the kids, um, by their uh, thoughts, by their uh, vision, by their uh, eagerness to solve, you know, real world problems. I'm hoping I explained it well. You did. And I, I really like the idea of not just doing one or two wise, but really pushing the five and I would think that that would probably really kind of push students a little bit out of their comfort zones, but I love that you got positive feedback from it. And remember, a lot of the growth that we have, especially when learning a new language, I can certainly vouch that the growth that I had, the exponential growth is doing things that I was very uncomfortable with. So I like the idea. I, I plan to implement that, the five whys into my classroom. Thank you for sharing that. That's fantastic. Thank you. And I'll pass that question again. It's the same question to Waltz Lao Shi. And the question is, again, dealing with interaction and what online activities have you found are most effective in engaging students in online interaction in your online Mandarin Chinese classroom? Mm -hmm. 
Well, um, in my classroom online, well, actually in my classroom face-to-face -face as well, we don't do pair work and we don't do group work, which is kind of unusual from a lot of people's perspective. Um, but we do talk to each other all the time, constantly, all the time. In fact, I have some students, I kind of have to try to shut them up, which is gratifying, but not gratifying at the same time. Um, but the question is, just what uh, Koslausch said that, or Gaulausch rather, why would the students want to listen? And that's been the flaw in textbooks since time immemorial that, you know, Juan va a la biblioteca, you know, John's going to the library. Who cares? Who's John? Where's the library? Why is he going? We don't care, you know. So we're going to try to personalize things. We want to try to make these things relatable to the kids. I've taught middle school, I've taught high school, I've taught college, I've taught adults. Um, so I, right now I do mostly high school and up. I don't really take middle school as online because, because reasons. But anyways, um, I love middle schoolers in person. But we try to find compelling topics. Now, obviously, like the video you just saw, I wouldn't say that I particularly care whether these people like Justin Bieber or not. I really don't care. But at least it was something relatable enough that they cared a little bit for that time. Okay. So the point is not talking about things that I care about. It doesn't matter what I like. I'm doing a job, right? It matters what they are interested in. So if I'm teaching middle school and they still like SpongeBob, if they're sixth graders, then by gosh, we're going to talk about SpongeBob. And I'm going to look like SpongeBob is the most exciting thing I've ever heard in my life. And I'm thinking, Ugh, but that's just the way it is because I want, I'm looking at the quality of interaction with my kids or with the students with more adult kids, more adult kids, right? More adult people. Um, we can obviously go to a lot of topics that one would have to discuss carefully with kids. One example is I have uh, two groups right now that are at about around 150, 160 hours with me. So they have one class a week and they've been coming for a couple of years now, I guess, but it's about 150 hours. And so, um, and this was completely politically neutral, but the fact is that Donald Trump was recently indicted. And whether you like him or hate him, the fact was somebody, that thing occurred. So I just said to my students, you know, hey, let's talk about this. What happened? I heard there was some news about Donald Trump. Can you tell me what it was, you know? And then we went together. I had started out um, on the resource I use, which is a comprehended cloud. It's not private. Anybody can use it. Um, I started out with some words like uh, indicted and whatever. Good chance to teach bay, right? Bay, gow, and all this thing. Um, but I have enough blanks there that when they suggested a word that they needed, we could put it up and then use it. And because I'm still driving the bus, right? I can steer that conversation so that we get some immediate sort of almost artificially frequent use of that new word so that they help, it helps to get it into their heads more. But they're going to, at that level, they're going to remember what they need personally, and they're going to forget what they don't. And so I feel like my job as a Chinese teacher is to offer them the chance to get the vocabulary that they need. They've already had most of the structure I mean, even in high school after Chinese too, there's not any more grammar to teach them. They've already done it all, at least with CI they have. So it's basically building vocabulary and, and getting things like that in there. The other thing with uh, the accountability piece, um, I don't really like after activities because anything where you're asking for information, we don't know how that information got between the students if they're somewhere else. The worst example I've ever seen, this, it's, it's one of these funny, not funny things. I, I worked at a Star Talk where they wanted to use um, abacus with the kids. So they taught them how to use an abacus, and then they set up this contest. They gave them sums, and they had to work them out and you know pass it down, and then the last one would write down. Well, they didn't do, use the abacus to do the calculation. The kids were doing the math on paper, moving the beads to show the answer, and then here it is. And you, I can't blame them for that because human beings use the easiest pathway to get what they need done, done. I have a good friend in Taipei. 
he's an interpreter, I'm an interpreter, okay? I do seminar for the Department of State, so supposedly I'm fluent in Chinese. Um, he's also trains interpreters over there, so he's fluent. We're both white, we're both native English speakers. So when we get together over there, we always say, let's speak Chinese this time. You know, if we're in Taiwan, let's speak Chinese. And we start off and three minutes later, we're speaking English. We're two fully fluent people with the desire to speak Chinese together, and yet we can't. And that's sociolinguistics, which it's, it's a big topic, but it's, to me, it's not realistic to expect adolescents or even adults really to stick to a second language, even if they are very, very motivated because they just don't have the tools yet. You know, their, their bucket of sophistication in Chinese is, is almost empty. Their bucket of sophistication in English is full. And it's very frustrating for them when they want to do something like that. So I tend to do uh, real-time accountability rather than doing an after activity. And that means working the crowd. Have you ever seen a, a politician or somebody at a meeting who's really, really good at social networking? They come into the room and they look around and they start going to everybody and they don't miss anybody. They speak to everyone, but they still, you know, they're still paying attention to others. Same with this. I'm going to say, like to, um, I was in the tape, it was some kid, guy named Gonzalo, right? Oh, you, uh, you think Superman's cool. Um, I don't remember the names in the class there, but, you know, Betty, did Gonzalo say he thought Superman was cute? So this is keeping them accountable for listening to what's going on, even though I might be speaking directly to one student. They never know when I'm going to pop over to them. Or I'm going to compare them. I'm going to say, gosh, Gonzalo said Superman was cool, but Betsy said he was, you know, a big zero. So Betsy perks her ears up and somebody else does. And they know that. But at the same time, they know I will not ask them something that will embarrass them in class. So I can differentiate my questions that way as well. I might ask one of my struggling, more struggling students a very direct question on information. With the ones that are getting it better, I'm gonna ask a more integrative question. So um, that's essentially it. I think that it's all about talking about things that they really care about, not that I care about necessarily, um, but things that they care about. And that also means folks reading the novels and the, the magazines that your students read. At least look them over so you know what's going on in, you know, tween land or high school student land or whatever it is. I read Twilight. I admit it. I read it because at that time, my students were all reading Twilight. I'm like, well, I better know what's in this thing. You know, it wasn't that bad. And I love how you made the point about differentiating that instruction to some extent and the students who are struggling you're not going to call them out you're going to keep them in an environment where they're still feeling comfortable they're still going to build rapport with you and not feel like they're going to be dogpiled for making a mistake and as an educator I appreciate it. I love hearing fellow educators having that similar philosophy and I think that's kind of a good segue into the next question if you don't mind me asking you kind of putting you on the spot for this but our next question is talking about Whenever students are struggling, whenever you find their students who are learning Mandarin Chinese are struggling with engaging in these online interpersonal activities, how do you personally overcome those challenges? Students who are struggling in engaging in the online activities. Yeah, so don't the think students, I've ever maybe these are your quiet students, or maybe they are, um, you know, maybe autistic, they just, say it out loud, autistic. It's okay. I'm autistic. I'm good with it. I was thinking more. Um, I come across a lot of social yeah. anxiety. I, oh, yeah. it seems every year I have a student who will kind of privately ask, can we talk in zoom afterward? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And they will say, I'm just too shy. Or I, I maybe they feel like they are not understanding a lot of that imposter syndrome too. I find a lot of students have that imposter syndrome because they, in their heads are thinking, oh, I should be at this level, but yeah, you know, hey, you've only just started and that's okay. We're all starting at some point. So if you have situations like that, how do you as an educator personally try to help those students overcome those situations? Um, speaking, if I'm in a public school situation, for example, um, the first thing I'm gonna do is go to the guidance counselor. Is there something on this kid's record that I'm not aware of? Um, the first week of school, I have already called that child's parents because I call the parents of every child the first week of school. 
before there's a problem. You call them, you say, hey, Mrs. Jones, this is your child's Chinese teacher. And I just wanted to say, I am so looking forward to having George in class this year. He's got such a great smile. I can tell he's a neat kid, you know, and I'd like to encourage you to email me anytime you, you feel that there's something that, that needs to be said to me, okay, or that you just like to say. And that, that investment of time gets me a lot over the course of the year because when George turns out to be a kid who is unidentified ADHD or something and he just can't control himself in class, I can call his mom and his mom already views me as an equal, as a friend, not as, oh my God, the phone's ringing and somebody's complaining about George again. What did he do now? You know, so it gives me a, a different point of departure with that parent. Um, besides that, I'm just going to essentially let them do what they do as long as it's not seriously affecting anyone else's, you know, problem. But we were asking more about those who are having problems interacting, not those who are over interacting. So let me get back on the other side of the, the, the coin there. Um, if I have quiet students, I frequently find autistic students in my classes who may or may not be identified. Now, uh, the most recent one was I had one in a high school class who just ticked all the boxes but had not been identified. And she was not going to be a speaker. She just was not going to speak. And I'm like, well, you know what? That's okay. Because people acquire language by listening and reading, not by speaking. Practice does not make proficient. Okay? Practice doesn't make proficient. So if she doesn't speak, she doesn't move her mouth during class, that's okay. As long as she has some way that she can comfortably demonstrate to me at some point that she does understand. And actually, even if she doesn't, because I'm going to trust my kids. I had a kid, a sixth grader who put his head down the whole semester, never looked up. He still acquired language. Not as much as those who had been, you know, oh, with their hands in the air and activity, but they did acquire. So in terms of acquiring and all that, I really feel like there's a lot of room in the world today, especially we don't know what generational traumas our kids come with. We don't know what their current economic situation is. Are they living in their car? Do they know where they're going to sleep tonight? Did they eat? These are all questions that we are seeing more and more in our classes. So I can't expect Susie's first priority to be answering up in great Mandarin if she is insecure. Remember Maslow's hierarchy, right? If she doesn't have that first layer fixed, Chinese is self-actualization. It's not eating and being safe. So all of these things, I think, are the first things to consider. So I'm going to give Susie a pass, you know, and try to find out what the thing is. Talk to other teachers, talk to guidance, talk to the parents, see if there's a way we can fix it. You know, but even if she doesn't speak, she'll acquire. She has a brain. She speaks a first language. She's good. Absolutely. And there is sort of that element of we need to recognize that our students are just different individuals. So acquiring language might look very different for John than it does for James. And just, hey, that is what it is. Um, I will certainly vouch as an online educator. For me personally, it seems like every year I always get some sort of surprise and it's a reminder that we don't always know what's going on at the other end of the computer screen. And I personally have just learned to always show grace and keep that door open for communication. My students know that they can always come to me if they've got concerns or just need to talk about things. And, and what you talked about, sort of investing those coins in that piggy bank at the end of the year, building the connection with the student and the parent. So when you have to come to them later, if something isn't quite where we want it to be, we've already got that rapport built. So that's that's a fantastic tool. Thank you for sharing that. And always, fantastic. always, always benefit of the doubt. Assume yep. good intention. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Excellent. Um, same question. And we will pass to Jin Laoshi. And the question once again was, what do you find students learning? Sorry. What do you find students learning Mandarin Chinese struggle with the most when we're engaging in online and interpersonal activities and how do you overcome these challenges? Um, I think, uh, well, I, well, and I was listening to uh, Perry uh one thing, you, you know, <laughs> stuck in my mind was, I kept thinking about my uh, level four class because uh, in my school district, 
uh, we really have students coming from different backgrounds. So we have, um, we have a placement test to place students into the right level. So in my level four class, it's very interesting. You, you can see freshmen speaking pretty good, you know, Chinese, you know, knows a lot. You can also see senior students whose language proficiency might not be as, you know, high as those freshmen, but their learning skill is really strong. So I just actually, I always tell myself, those students who invested four years into learning Chinese in their high school, they are my baby, <laughs> you know, they are, they are my babies, right? And I'm just, you know, I start to think about the, the, the seniors I just had this past school year. I actually taught them Chinese one and they learned Chinese two with a different Chinese teacher, learned Chinese three with another Chinese teacher. Now they were in my level four. And all four years, you know, I had Korean students, Indian students, they, they, they had zero Chinese. So I just feel like I need to help them. I, they struggle maybe the most. On the one hand, they, I think they are aware of that. Those little, you know, little kids, their language is much stronger. You know, as senior students, they are like, oh, a little bit, you know, discouraged. I need to help them to, you know, really continue their learning. Hopefully not even just in high school. I'm hoping in college, they will continue learning Chinese, right? So one thing I did was my first group activity for the you know, first semester was I told my students, uh, whoever will have a senior student in the class, in, in the group, well, get extra credit because usually that, you know, they were like, oh, their Chinese is not as strong as, you know, as uh, me. I don't want to work in the same group with, with them. But now hey, there is an incentive. And I told uh, my freshman students, I give you a little extra work. Observe how they work. Pick up at least one skill, like learning skill or collaboration or whatever skill from those senior students and be ready to share with me what you have learned from them. So um, the second act, uh, group work, I actually said, whichever group will have a freshman will get a little extra credit, just a little, but you know, for the high school kids, extra credit matters a lot, right? So I think I'm hoping to provide students um, different opportunities to really interact, work together, learn from each other. So everybody can grow, you know, uh, not just linguistically, but also, you know, uh, picking up new skills, being in, uh, inspired by, you know, their peers. And I think, um, of course, you know, when, it, when the learning was done online, it might be a little different, but I, I really want to just say for me, uh, I might want to say those students, uh, those senior students in higher level class, they, they need the most support and they might struggle the most. And they are the students we really need to uh, help and support a lot. And every time when I saw they did something really well, I made it a big deal. Look at you know this student, he just did a, great, uh, you know, presentational uh, presentation. Think about how well he did and think about he started learning Chinese less than four years ago from zero. This is what he can do. And let's give him a big round of applause. So this is, I think, what I want to share on this topic. I love that. And I love the idea of celebrating our students' wins. And even in the online environments, I will sometimes, if I see something, a student really knocks something out of the park, and I want to share this as an example for the other students, I might add in one of my announcements, hey, check out Josh's submission on this particular assignment or listen to this feedback from Emily. 
it's amazing. And they're able to get that. They're learning from each other, essentially. And, and I love to incorporate that in. So thank you for sharing that. And again, the same question we will pass to Kosh Laoshi. And the question is, what do you find students learning Mandarin Chinese struggle the most with when engaging in online interpersonal activities? And how do you overcome these challenges? Sure. I think I just to echo a couple of things that have been said first, I think one of the things that was really that stood out in both of the other panelists, sort of the heart of what they're both saying is how important it is to get to know your students. Right. I think so often we're we have this sense as teachers that like we have so much content to cover. We're moving at this just breakneck pace all the time. And I'm always, what I always say to teachers is I believe you can teach it, but I don't believe that they're going to learn as much as you're here trying to teach. So if you cut 20% out of this curriculum that you're saying you're going to sort of get through before now and the end of the semester, I think you earn back in, in spades that time you invest getting to know the students, thinking about what they're interested in, but spending that time to get at the heart of whatever it is they're struggling with. Because I think some students are struggling with Chinese. It's Chinese related. It's a self-confidence thing. It's a they haven't had enough input and we're demanding way too much output of them. There's lots of sort of language and language adjacent things that could be going on. But there's also a lot of not Chinese things that could be going on. And I think a lot of what Terry just said really gets gets to some of that. So I guess something I would say before I talk a little bit about what to do for the language piece, I think take a deep breath and don't take it personally, because if you do the math, and I do do the math with my students every semester, I get 52 hours of them in class a semester, 52 hours over 15 weeks. That is 1% of their time is occupied by Chinese. And my students are taking Chinese as one of four, five, six, sometimes seven classes on top of a job, a social life, the pressure of being away from their family for maybe the very first time. It's not about me. The, their world is so much bigger than me and this language stuff we're doing as much as I believe in it and love it and have dedicated my life and career to it. It's just remembering that anything that they get in the limited amount of time that you have with them is a win. Anything. And that goes for day one nothing to something, but it also is that day four, I mean, year four, like Jen Osher was just talking about remembering, look how far you've come since year one. We say things all the time. Students say things and I correct them every time they say it. I've been learning Chinese for five, for four years. False. You've been learning Chinese for like the equivalent of a week. If we, if we calculate in hours, not in weeks, months, years, or days, we realize very quickly that the amount of exposure that they've had is minuscule. And so I think it, it helps us to sort of reset some expectations and to think about sort of we're actually anything we're doing is worth celebrating and is great. Now to get just a little bit, oh, and, and Terry said something else, Maslow's, right? Something a, a good friend, a dear teacher, colleague, friend of mine always says is Maslow's before Bloom's, right? We can't be talking about Bloom's taxonomy if we're not talking about Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? If we're not if students are not getting what they need in their regular life that goes far beyond school period and our Chinese class for sure, then <laughs> there's not much Bloom's taxonomy to be talked about. And those are bigger issues that we as individual Chinese teachers are not going to solve anyway. But if we get onto the language piece just for a minute and we sort of take out, even though we can't really do that because you can't take the human out of their humanity, right? But just to focus on their language related needs for a minute, I think it really is identifying the thing that they're struggling with, right? Is it, is it that the student doesn't want to try to speak, right? Is it that they don't want to engage in speaking at all, that when it comes time to talk that they say no? Or is it that they're going to do it and they realize that they don't have enough resources yet? Um, I think it's it the ability to sort of diagnose, to use a word that I don't actually love, to sort of figure out what's going on is the precursor to then being able to offer them some solutions. If it's that they are going to say something and the words are not coming, I would be willing to bet that we're not giving them enough input, that they haven't had enough language going in. You know, you can't spend money you don't have, right? So if you don't put the money in the bank, you're going to have a hard time withdrawing it back out of the bank when you go to do that, right? If it's that they need some scaffolding or they they either like linguistically need it or they psychologically need some scaffolding, 
it's figuring out what that scaffolding is. Do they know where to find it? Did I even bring it to the online space, right? Is it a place that they can go click and find a list of words that they might need to do the thing? Is it that it's actually like I've seen some teachers do, they put sort of words in the virtual background space that a student can literally see it on the screen if they happen to need it, right? I think it's, again, it's that idea of prepping before you get to class, making sure you're going to have some contingency possibilities available if it's a language thing. And if it's not a language thing, I think it's a take a step back. It's not about you. Be minimally a safe, welcoming space for this human who is going to be sitting with you for, you know, an hour plus every day or every couple of days. Um, and then beyond that, sort of, if you can be an advocate for that person in your school and community online or not, uh, you know, that's awesome. But if we're talking about language specifically, I think there's a there's a lot of reasons why a student might not want to engage in interaction. The students have complicated relationships with one another at school that also have nothing to do with you. They also come to you from different backgrounds, right? They come like, you know, she probably has students that are of Chinese descent. They might speak Cantonese. They might speak Fuzhouhua. They might speak Mandarin at home. And those students have different relationships to speaking Mandarin than non-Chinese students. Being in a classroom where there are heritage students is intimidating and changes your relationship with the language. You know, you're real confident until someone comes along who's more proficient than you. And then suddenly you're scared and nervous and all of these things, right? So it's, it really is understanding what the root of the struggle, we'll call it, is, and then sort of responding appropriately. And I think that goes certainly for online teaching but uh, would go for any classroom and space uh, anywhere, yeah. I would agree. And I think sometimes we get so wrapped up in the content and the online portion that sometimes we lose sight of the fact that there is this human at the other end of the computer and that is the person that you are working with. And I appreciate you really sharing your thoughts on how you kind of differentiate what is at the core? Is this more of a, just a being human and interpersonal relationships or confidence or is this something more of we just need to provide more input or provide different resources or scaffolding and, and I appreciate you breaking that down well this has been a fantastic couple of questions that we've gone through we just have some more questions coming up however we are about at 4.08 p.m my time here on the east coast so eight after the hour wherever you are let's go ahead and take a quick break we'll go ahead and pick up let's pick up at about 15 after the hour just give everybody a little time to stretch their legs get up and get water and all that good stuff and we'll pick up with our conversation then thank you everyone we'll pick up in about uh, 15 after the hour wherever you are Hi, everyone. We're back again and welcome back. Uh, we're just getting wrapped up with our break and we are going to start our second part of our panel discussion. And as we did have a great discussion about the human element of that interaction, another thing that we have to keep in mind as educators is making sure that we are show, leading by example, but really showing our students how to be good digital citizens. So my next question, and we'll go ahead and start with Jin Laoship. And the question is, how do you en engage students to abide by good digital citizenship practices, specifically when learning Mandarin Chinese online? I think it's a huge challenge. <laughs> and um, what I want to say is that um, I know in my school, uh, this online uh, you know, digital citizenship has been the topic among all subjects. And uh, we do have um, uh, like special, like we call that uh, advisory. So we, you know, the whole school uh, actually sat down together to spend some time talking with the students, you know, uh, what a good digital citizenship looks like. Uh, what are the do's and don'ts? But I think for me, I, as, as a lot of uh, teachers here, I think we used to uh, struggle with Google Translate. And now these days is chat GPT, right? Um, this is the conversation I have um, day one, you know, uh, when school start, a new school year starts. And I told my students this, um, 
I don't mind if you use Google Translate or ChatGPT as a dictionary. If you need one word, you know, to express yourself well, you, you need that word, feel free to do so. But keep in mind what you present to me, you turn in as your, your work. I take that's yours. Use, uh, using Google Translate um, and or ChatGPT should be a learning opportunity for you to expand your vocab, you know, to um, get your, it's like a self-led learning. I really want to use that word to express myself. Um, it did happen to me a couple of times. Students turned in a, a piece of writing I know is beyond them. So I usually just, you know, call them to me, ask them, are you able to explain to me what you just, you know, turned in in, in this work? Uh, if they were not able to do it, I just ask them, why can you tell me, you know, this is your work, but now you won't be able to explain. Can you tell me why? It's either, you know, my mom helped me to write it because we have some heritage learners, you know, in, in my school. Or, oh, I just use um, Google Translate to translate the words. And then we, we had a conversation, you know, um, this is not the way to, to learn. And also, I think another thing I did was, uh, I think one day we did a translation. I know it sounds weird, but we did. We did a paragraph translation. And, and then I used, actually, I used uh, ChatGPT to translate the same um, passage and I projected on, uh, on the projector and asked my students, are you able to understand what it says here? They actually didn't recognize this was the same, you know, uh, message. They did uh, translation themselves. And I was like, okay, can you see that here are some higher level words which you haven't learned yet, but can you guess, you know, what they are based on the context, the words before um, this specific word and the words after that, can you, you know, uh, figure out what that is. And at the end, I told them what happened. This is the same passage. It's just, I use Google uh, chat GPT to translate. But I told my students, keep those new words in mind. Those actually, those are the, the meaning of those words you guys know already. It's just now you will actually, this is an opportunity to learn a higher level word. And if you want to move up in the uh, proficiency ladder, you need to start to build more words, you know, higher level um, academic words. So again, um, when they do um, projects, usually I ask them to uh, cite a source. This is where I found and, you know, um, but I want to say, I know uh, I'm, I'm, I work in the Silicon Valley. I mean, my school is in the Silicon Valley. My kids, they can, they, they even told me, if you need your, your personal uh, learning management system, we can do the coding for you very quickly. They, I mean, I, I think I hate to, um, it's, like a, it's like a chasing game. You know, like new technology tools keep popping up and we have to chasing after the students. I hate that, but I really want my students to understand this is for the, this is a learning, learning opportunity. And um, it's a challenge for the teachers as well. For the students, they want to learn something that can really challenge their mind. They want to learn something that is like, they, they, haven't, they haven't learned yet. So I, I always like to say this, I'm hoping my classroom, of course I'm teaching Zhuozi, which is desk, or pen, this is B. For high school kids, they know this is a pen. They just don't know how to say it in another language. But of course, I want to teach them how to say it in you know, another language. But at the same time, I want to teach them something or present some information they have not seen, what they have not learned from other classroom yet. Their English teachers haven't talked about it. Their social studies teachers haven't talked about that. It's, 
it's a challenge, but it's also fun. I remember those moments when I presented, you know, some interesting information to them. I can see their eyes it's like shining, and I see stars in their eyes. A, a very um, a example came into my mind is I teach my Chinese one, you know, school supplies, you know, bi, shu bao, all of those, right? And a Chinese teacher actually shared with me uh, in Africa, uh, a, a Chinese company is selling solar backpacks in Africa. So when kids go to school, they actually collect solar energy because you know on the backpack, there were solar uh, panels to collect uh, energy, right? When they go home, some kids don't have electricity at home in, at night. They can use that to do their homework. So it's a simple backpack can actually have a lot of story to talk about. Those are the things I think I want to really share with my students. Am I off topic? I'm sorry. <laughs> not at all. Not at all. And it, there is there there's definitely a challenge. I can certainly relate. We want to stay on top of the latest technologies and the latest trends. But when we can find the new things, the real world connections that bring in things that our students are really interested in, they care about and connect it to their Mandarin Chinese. That's really when the learning occurs and that you can definitely see in how they engage, even the online environment. I can tell when it's a topic they're really interested in. If we're talking about, say, popular music and they're writing paragraphs about their favorite musicians and, and it, it's just fun to see that interaction. So thank you. I agree. That's a great way to build those digital, or the, uh, the uh, digital citizenship rather. Thank you. Uh, Kas Laoshi, same question to you, and this is again about digital citizenship. How do you engage students to abide by good digital citizenship practices, specifically when learning Mandarin Chinese online? Sure, that's a good question, and I'm really glad Jin Lao brought up Google Translate and ChatGPT because I think these are things. I think the ChatGPT scare, if we want to call it that, in our field is very similar to the Google Translate scare of five or five or 10 years ago, where sort of everybody, when it first came out, was freaking out and worried that, you know, it's going to replace language teaching and it's going to, students are going to cheat and all of these things. And I want to go back to something that, that Terry said earlier, which is assume, you know, assume the best, right? So I think the first thing that is important is that we don't go into misuse of digital tools with the assumption that our students are bad, evil, doing it intentionally, doing it to spite us, all of these sort of negative deficit kind of mindset perceptions that we have of students, you know, and we don't, and we don't go into the conversation, why are you cheating all these things, right? I think it, it if we're talking about those kinds of tools specifically, it really is important to have some conversations with some different people about what they are and what they're not, what they can be used for, what they can't be used for, what expectations are, and I will be the first one to tell you, you know, cheating is always about grades and never about learning. So if you think about it like that, someone using something like ChatGPT or Google Translate to get a grade is because you gave them an assignment and it's holding, it's being held over their heads. And for whatever reason, because of language ability or because they're too busy, they're overworked, underslept, who knows why, they want to still get the grade and they take a shortcut to get the grade, but that's not about learning. It, it, it's not about learning from the student's perspective. They know that they're not learning, and it's certainly not going to result in all that much learning. So I think those conversations are important to have with students and respect that they are autonomous, you know, adolescents or college students, people love to call college students adults. Mm, they're legally adults, but they're high school kids plus a summer break. They're not adults. Um, and to help them think through some of these things, because they're being overwhelmed with just as much information as we are, and they don't, they have no reason to think about responsible use of tools if that thinking and conversation is not being modeled and being explicitly done with them, not just around them. So I think having conversations with students is really important, but I think having those conversations on your teaching team, on your, in your building, sort of what is your school culture around the use of things like online tools in general resources, something like ChatGPT. It's also important to have conversations with parents because if my mom doesn't understand how language acquisition works and she's like, well, I don't know how to help you with your homework. Why don't you use Google Translate? 
that's not always coming from a bad place. That's coming from a, I'm mom and I don't speak Chinese. So I don't know how to help you. And I know that this thing exists. So maybe that can help you. And I don't know that that might do more harm than good in terms of your actual language development. So I think for the first half of my answer, the piece that's really important is those really clear conversations around expectations and what the tool is and what it's not and what it, what you as a community of learners and teachers are okay with and what, what, where the lines are, where the boundaries are and why those boundaries are there and what happens when the boundary is crossed, right? If we're a community and we agree that we're here to learn Chinese and interact and benefit from this and support one another, then when someone isn't, you know, holding up that community norm that we decided together is important, what are we going to do about it? What, what do we as a group believe is the best course of action? And then for, I, I love something that Dean also just said, and I think this is something that language classes actually do really, really nicely sometimes, which is that in addition to sort of giving you new ways to say the same things that you already know, we're sort of, we do have opportunities because we're going to ask you to do things like make presentations or do some kind of project or, or look information up, leverage your multilingual resources, go interview somebody, whatever. I think we do have lots of opportunities to help students with things as simple as like, if you're going to make a PowerPoint, link the sources. And that's a very simple thing, but it's something that maybe no one ever told them in their academic life yet. And that's a part of dig digital citizenship. It's if you're going to go cite sources, learning maybe a little bit about reliability of an online information and how there's lots of information online doesn't mean it's all good. Um, I think because we're interacting so much as a community, especially in an online space, we can talk a little bit about what it means to be kind in online interaction. And that's that's a part of digital citizenship also. And then one, honestly, I think maybe this is, Jen also called it the Zoom year, you know, in the in, in that year, something that I did I taught every every level of classes I was teaching that year had a unit that was something along the lines of health and wellness or whatever. And we kind of shifted it topically to be a little more about mental well-being because that year in particular was challenging for, for college students living at home or not at home. Um, one thing that I on that I assigned students a couple of times was just to like get off your screens. Like your assignment tonight is to leave your house, go do something outside and then come ready to share what you did tomorrow in class. And something that I learned as I was thinking a little more about digital citizenship for this panel is part of digital citizenship is balancing being in a digital space and being not. And I thought, wow, what a cool thing that we can be modeling, which is a thing that I think we're probably all guilty of is that we sit on our technology too much. And that as good as it is for all kinds of reasons for connection and communication and things, even sometimes helping our high school and younger and older students self-regulate a little bit around like how much am I actually spending time on my phone, teaching them that they can click a button on an iPhone and find like that screen time report and have them go, whoa, I spent 14 hours a day on my phone last week. That's a scary number. How do I feel about that? And what do I want to do differently next week, right? Those are things you can do really easily in another language that have meaningful sort of impact. And then you'll get students who come back and say, you know, I cite my sources in other classes now too. And I look at them and go, wow, you're 22. I, I, I wish you had done that before this year, but I'm glad you learned how to do that in a Chinese class. That's a cool thing that in addition to some language that you're getting in terms of sort of these life skills. So yeah, lots of, lots of cool things to think about there. Fantastic. And I love how you talked about leading by example and us sort of taking a step back and saying, well, you know, we as a group came together at the consensus that these are the norms that we're going to abide by. Now, as an educator, I need to do that, too. And I need to show my students I need to lead by example. That's very important in digital citizenship. Thank you for that. Uh, Waltz Lao Shi, same question. And again, this is about digital citizenship. How do you engage students to abide by good digital citizenship practices, specifically when learning Mandarin Chinese online? Well, I think as our other two panelists pointed out, a lot of the digital citizenship issues come from some of the newer technologies like ChatGPT and Google Translate, which is new compared to when we in the dark ages were you know, learning from paper books and stuff. But um, I think that that in large part flows from what we're asking students to do and how we've prepared them to do it or failed to prepare them to do it. 
the key to getting students not to rely on mechanical translation is to make it faster and easier to just do the translation themselves. And that means they need to have acquired language in their brains ready to use. And that in turn means, this is like the, not the five whys, but like the five and so then things. But so then we have to think about, um, are we making assignments to be done when they're not under our eyes? Because that's when that happens generally. Are we making assignments that are take home or do outside the classroom or asynchronously or whatever that are really within the bounds of what they can reasonably be expected to do at this point of their Mandarin careers or not? There, and there's a difference with that. Their understanding hopefully is always going to be ahead of their productive ability, right? So whenever I can, I'm gonna give assignments that are receptive assignments, listening or reading rather than production, okay? Because number one, that eliminates that problem. But number two, I know that if they are getting comprehended language from those activities coming in, right? Hopefully even from native speakers who get their tones better than I did, don't be writing to me about that video now, um, then that's gonna benefit them. And it's going to go directly toward their pool of language and it's gonna be correct. On the other hand, if I have students who are go off and they're given a topic they're not familiar with, and I'm talking about students at first, second, maybe third year, maybe not talking about AP. I'm not talking about students who have already acquired all the major structure of the language firmly and correctly. But before that, we get a lot of students going off and they do their best, but they're, they have to fall back on their native language if they're not using a tool. And it gets so convoluted and so difficult for them that they go for the tool. That makes sense, just makes sense. So I think that we only have, you know, in a typical high school class, we have 108 hours a year. And that's before we take away assemblies, music lessons, field trips, bomb scares, school shootings, whatever it is. You know, these days there's a bigger and bigger list of things that nibble away at our instructional time. We have to think about the assignments that we give as carefully as we think about what we're doing in the classroom. And really, the big thing that I've learned, and uh, I liked uh, Galausha mentioning this, is that I totally agree. The less I teach, the more they comprehend and the more proficient they become. Because I want to teach narrow and deep. Okay, So I'm concentrating on getting my students to acquire the structure of the language. How does the language work? They don't need to know 5,000 characters to do that. They need to know a subset of the vocabulary of Chinese. And I'm gonna pick that to be the highest frequency words, which they will hear the most, and the words that are specific to their lives. When I taught in Hawaii, I taught the word surfing because everybody surfed, but here in New York, I don't teach surfing anymore because, except if, if it's for fun, you know, very different reactions. So I'm going to want to make the best use of that and not teach nearly as much. I'd even go beyond the 20%. Now, I am lucky that I teach for myself now and I don't have to cover a certain amount. But when I used to have to do that, I would simply triage the textbook. I would go through the textbook with an Excel spreadsheet and write all the vocabulary words in the left column. And then in the next column, I would write, yes, that's really important. Two for, eh, yeah, it's a, if I get to it, that would be good. And three for who thought that was a good idea for a second year textbook? Because, you know, even as a fluent speaker, I was looking up a lot of those words. I didn't know what they were necessarily. You know, oh my God, teachers are, you know, admitting they don't know everything. Not even close, you know, especially as a non-native speaker, forget it. So I think that's the big things to look at. The other thing that helps, I think, is designing the audience for them. I like to say to my students, if you're going to write this thing, write it so that your classmates can read it. So it encourages them to stay to the pool of language that they have. If I have those future language teachers of America who are super, super fast, or, or maybe their heritage or something, I'm gonna give them a different assignment. I'm not gonna give them the same assignment. 
so that because it's very hard for native speakers or, or more proficient people to write in that little narrow fence that students can understand at a certain point of course. But anyway, those would be my suggestions to help them design their audience and to make it easier to do the work themselves than to do it in some other way, you know. And I like that you talked about the need for differentiated instruction. And I can certainly imagine if I were coming from a background of a heritage speaker, if I were constrained to a small pool, I could imagine that would be really stressful for me. It might cause me to shut down a little bit, but I like that we're on the online environment, especially, <clears throat> excuse me, we're able to do that. We're able to provide that differentiated instruction. Thank you very much for that. Uh, we are coming up on the end of our session. And just a gentle reminder, if anyone would like to turn on their camera and ask a question, the panelists would absolutely love to have a few of you do that if there's time. Um, also, just as a friendly reminder, those of you who are earning the digital badge, we will be sending out another message with some follow-up information, kind of like what we did on Monday with information about our hands-on activity for this round that we've got up. And definitely, if you have any questions, I am also a real person. I'll go ahead and put my email address in the chat. So if anyone has any questions, needs help with anything, or just spinning your wheels on any activities, please do not hesitate to reach out to me. I am more than happy to help answer questions or maybe give you some ideas. So I'll go ahead and put that in the chat. And if anyone would like to turn on their camera and ask a question, we would love to have you.